All right, before we start, let us begin with prayer. As you all know, 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do this to recover the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. So let's pause for a moment of silence with our heads bowed, and then I'll open in prayer in just a moment. Let us pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to assemble together with the believers in Christ. We know that this is critical during this time and age, this day and age. There are so many um, viewpoints out there that is trying to distract us from the absolute divine viewpoint, which is your view. So we pray now that as we continue to move through this particular study, the spiritual life, you would help us to focus and see what the issues are related to here and now, so that we can make application in our lives, thus bringing you the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to you and to you alone. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, a few announcements, or actually one announcement. So if you can notate this on a piece of paper or on your calendar, uh, next week will be our last class. We're going to conclude on the 21st we're going to end thursday next week thursday so we're going to hit tuesday wednesday thursday tuesday wednesday thursday will be our last sessions next week tuesday wednesday thursday thursday being our last week and then we will resume studies on january the 9th january the 9th this will allow us to have some time to get ready for christmas and new year's I know that's the, the time when everyone is busy. And so rather than having to worry about, are we meeting for study tonight? We'll just take those nights off so that everybody can relax and just have enough time to get ready for holidays, friends, family, uh, preparation that's needed for Christmas and New Year's, New Year's Eve, New Year's. So there's a lot going on and I recognize that. So We'll pick up on January <clears throat> the 9th, to be specific. So the 8th of January, the week of the 8th, we'll be resuming beginning with the 9th. So to keep it simple, January 9th is when we'll resume. Okay, We'll resume class on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, beginning with the 9th of January. So that should give us plenty of time to relax and enjoy the holidays with our family and friends reflecting on how God has been gracious to us. We survived. We're going to pass another year, and he's allowed us to encounter and enjoy a new year. And if that's the case, that should be, serve as a reminder that he has plans for us, okay? So if you make it to New Year's, that means he's not finished with you, not finished with us. So please take this opportunity to use your time wisely, redeem the time, be productive, rest, uh, do what it takes to get recharged. And then when we get back in January, we'll recharge spir spiritually speaking, okay? So again, we will resume on January the 9th. And we will take next week to Thursday and end on Thursday the 21st. That'll be our last session for next week. We will have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but Thursday will be the last session that we will meet, okay? Any Pastor, what about the Sunday service? Sunday will still always go on. Every okay, Sunday will you. continue. Thank you. Yeah, this, the, the Sunday, uh, the 24th, we will not be meeting. The 24th, I will have some things to do, and we're not gonna meet on the 24th, so, but we will live stream a Christmas party on Saturday which is, let me make sure I have the date here, up this coming Saturday, and that is going to be the 16th. So you're all welcome to join us. We will live stream our message. And so I would encourage you, this is the same link here. Uh, but if you're local, why not join us? And Stacy, you might want to uh, connect with uh, Deacon Winston or Deacon Steve or uh, Karen, who is our admin. And they'll give you the information, the location where we're at, and uh, join us in person. I think you'll have a blast. 
And so okay. for those who do not, what's that? I'm sorry. I just said, okay. Okay. So we're, you're in Mission Vale. We're in Elisa Vejo. So we welcome you back, uh, Stacy. I'm glad you can join us again. Thank you. So yeah, there's a reason why we met. Yes. And so we would love to fellowship with you. And I think you'll enjoy our little group. It caught it. It, uh, is conducive for strong fellowship and good friendships. So please reach out to any of them here. Winston, Karen, Steve, please reach out to them. Reach out to Stacy, and let her know where we meet and the times uh, accordingly so that she can adjust and uh, join us on Sunday. So you can uh, messenger, messenger her or message. Yeah. <laughs> messenger. <laughs> yeah, messenger her. <laughs> So let's, uh, I'm going to take us through a passage from Galatians. We're going to move through what is the spiritual life. And again, we're, our role model is Jesus Christ. So we're going through this book here on the screen. What is the spiritual life? And we're going to cover a few things here. And why is that important to know what the spiritual life is? Is because we have a life that is governed by God, the Holy Spirit. We have access to a superior power than anything else. And so when we look at what God's word has to say and recognize that we are sons and daughters of the most high, then we have access to a divine power or a horsepower, I would call it, the power to live in such a way that people will see and notice that we're uniquely different. We're not panicking. We're not freaking out when circumstances are collapsing all around us. So we have access to this, and that's part of the spiritual life. And I'd like to say this up front, that to me, the Christian life is really when a person is properly adjusted to Jesus Christ. The spiritual life, which I think is, I believe is different, is properly aligned to when a believer is properly aligned to God, the Holy Spirit. So that might sound like the same thing, but it's slightly different. The Christian life is when you're properly adjusted to Jesus Christ. So therefore, you're a child or a, a son or a daughter of the Most High, whereas the spiritual life is the horsepower of it all. When you're properly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit, you have that ability, the supernatural ability to do the things that He wants you to do and to say yes when He wants you to say yes and say no when He wants you to say no. Now, will you consistently do that? No, not always. But you have the ability. That's the difference. You have the ability, whereas unbelievers don't. So we're now trying to study the spiritual life, which will allow us to experience a power like never before, a peace like never before, a stability like never before. So if you're yearning for a peace, a joy, a stability like never before, this is what this study is all about. So before we start, let's look at a passage from Scripture. And I thought we would look at this verse, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, because this relates to our study. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, which says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. So if a person is properly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit, these are the fruit of the Spirit. This is what you should experience. Now, I know you might be saying, well, I'm trying to be a little bit more loving. I'm trying to be a little bit more joyful. I'm trying to have peace. I'm trying to be a little bit more patient, long-suffering, and I'm trying to be kind every day. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to be gentle when I speak to people. And I have self-control. I really try my best, Pastor Freddie. Well, that's the wrong way to approach it. Because notice, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not your fruit. It's not something that you can conjure up in your soul. It's not something that you can just say, I'm going to try. I'm going to work on these things. Because it's not your fruit. So this is the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. So it's His fruit, not yours. Now, if you're properly adjusted to Him and you're maturing in the faith, that's a different story. Now you should exhibit these qualities over time. Now, do I always exhibit this? No, not at all. 
But over time, I noticed that it's a little bit easier to be a little bit more joyful, a little bit more peaceful as I'm aligned with God, the Holy Spirit. I'm already a Christian, so I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to try because that's a one-time transac transaction at the moment of faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. However, these traits here, these characteristics, which ultimately come and mirror the life of Christ, is going to come as a result of the Spirit of God. It's his fruit. So as I'm maturing, I start to see that these things like gentleness and self-control, I'm noticing that it's becoming much more pronounced in my life. Not because I'm trying. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and try to be self have self-control. I'm going to be a little bit more patient towards my family. No, it's not like that. I don't try. I just notice over time that when something challenges any of these things, I catch myself saying, hmm, under normal circumstances, I would have lashed out. I would have been pretty ticked off. But today it's different. So I realize that these are the marks of ongoing maturity. So am I working on it? Like I said before, no, I'm not. It's just a byproduct of a healthy relationship going upwards, spiritual maturity, up that spiritual ladder over time. So it does work. I can, I can attest to that because I lacked any, all of these prior to conversion. I was never loving, joyful, peaceful. I never had patience. I was never really kind. I was thoughtful maybe. I had goodness about me, but that was just my nature. I was faithful in the things that I would do, but that's human. That's my nature. By nature, I'm like some of this. But deep down inside, when the going gets tough and the tough gets going, I know when I fail because these are not something that come naturally for me. But I notice that over time, and time is years, sometimes months, but when I started to take seriously my faith, and especially during my seminary days, when I would have to study because I had something to aim for, I, I needed to aim for a good grade. And so as I studied, uh, the byproduct of that is a renewed mind. So I would study, 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 and my objective was to get a good grade. But I noticed that certain things about me were changing. So I know the word of God transforms because I'm living proof for myself. And I, I can attest to this, that as I would study more, although my objective back then was to get a good grade, to pass, but I noticed that these things were being more pronounced over time. And I said, how did this happen? Why am I a little bit more under control? I have self-control before I would just flare out, lash out. So it does work. So that's why you'll repeatedly, repeatedly hear me say, don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said when talking to the adversary and deflecting the temptations of the devil himself. Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there I would connect the dots. And in my life, I would see it does work. So as a pastor, I've been, I've been advocating this because it really works. So going back to the text now, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So look closely at what it says in, in this passage here, this verse, these two verses here. You have, you have the following. It's important to note that the notice the word fruit. You see that word there, fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Notice that it's in the singular. We've seen this before, right? It's not plural. You would think that it would say the fruits of the Spirit because there are several characteristics here. But it's singular, which indicates that these qualities are not separate entities, but rather different aspects of a single fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits, fruit singular. So they're not separate entities, but rather different aspects of the single fruit. 
So this suggests that they're interconnected and should be present together in our lives. So they're connected together by the fact that they are uh, in, incorporated in the word fruit itself. So it's the qualities are not separate, but different aspects of the single fruit. What's the first one uh, mentioned here? Love. This love is not a mere emotional feeling, but a selfless, sacrificial love, uh, love that seeks the well-being of others. Let me repeat. So think about this word love. It's the unconditional God-like love, the agape love. This love is not an emotional feeling, but a selfless, sacrificial love that seeks the well-being of other people, other believers. So it's not centered on self. It's focused on others. It's a reflection of God's love for humanity, for God so loved the world. Adverb of degree. For God so loved you and me. For God so loved the world. So regardless of what you're going through, just know he's in your corner. He loves you. He's always there for you. So that even when you feel like giving up, don't give up because God's not done. He's just allowing you to go through things because that's a natural, normal process of every believer, every child of God. But his love does not cease. It doesn't stop. The scripture says he will not give you something that you cannot handle. So if you're going through a lot, that just means that you can handle a lot. And God's not, God's not going to allow you to be overwhelmed. You may think you're overwhelmed, but he knows when the time is to step in and lift the load off you. But for some reason, he's allowing you and me to go through the things that we're going through for fortification of the soul so that we can strength, have our faith strengthened in him. So if that's the case, then he loves you. So he's not going to give you anything that you can't handle. As a loving father, as you're lifting up that boulder on your shoulder, he's also got one hand on it, holding it and making sure it doesn't crush or demolish you. Now, I, I know you, you may not believe that, but that's just how the word of God speaks of his love towards his children. You, the Bible is replete. He's not going to give you anything that you can't handle. So that alone is assurance that he's not going to leave you by yourself. He'll never leave you hanging as people would leave us hanging from time to time. You're expecting them to be there in your corner. Your loved one is supposed to be there, your, your uh, major support. She's not there. He's not there. But he is there. God is there for you, though it may not feel like it at times. So. The first quality is love. It's not an emotional kind of feeling, but a selfish, sacrificial love that seeks the well-being of others. So that's the fruit of love that should flow from your life and mine towards the people around us because he lives in you, he lives in me. And so that expression should flow from us naturally as we exhibit the fruit of what? His spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So as we have this ongoing, vibrant relationship with Him, the byproduct in our lives should be love. So it should be sacrificial. It should be You should be looking at others. And so when you see someone, when you're at work and you see them, you should think about them and how can I make it easier for him? How can I make it easier for her? Now, I know that sounds unnatural at times. What? You know, to each his own. You, you let him do it. Let her do it. But that's not the God way of doing things. So when you can't, you'll notice that there's a deficiency or there's something that needs to be developed a little bit more. So he's going to allow you to see your shortcomings so that you can know and recognize that that's an area that needs to be fine-tuned just a little bit more. And that's why he probably will allow you to suffer or go through hardships just a little bit more because that's what's going to fortify that particular area as far as Galatians 5 is concerned. Because remember, James 1 buttresses the fact that uh, we should count it all joy when we encounter trials and tribulations. Why? Because the testing of your faith is working something in your life and mine which will result in patience and endurance. 
So if you're if you're shorting in any of these areas, it's not that the fruit of the spirit is coming up short. It's because that area of the fruit is not being exhibited because there's something that in your life that needs to be strengthened just a little bit more. So God is going to allow us whatever that is, but specifically the pressures of life, because that's what's going to produce the patience and the endurance, which will flow these attributes here as found in Galatians 5. Because all of these are a part of humility, a, a humble spirit, and someone that's consistently dependent upon him. Pride is not the issue for the believer in Christ. And when that's the case, the fruit of the spirit will be the byproduct and will flow in your life and through your life. And so that's the result of a harmonious relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and especially God, the Holy Spirit, which is what we're talking about as far as what is his spiritual life. So then you next up in, on the uh, list of attributes is joy. Joy is a deep seated gladness and contentment, or I like to call it stability. It's, a, it's different from happiness. Remember, happiness is being happy because oh, I got a raise and uh, someone said hello to me. I, oh, I'm so happy. And there's nothing wrong with getting a raise or someone saying hello and noticing you. But joy is really the inner seated gladness and contentment and even stability. I would go that far to say stability that comes, listen to this, from a relationship with God, regardless of circumstances. You're so cool and collective amidst the circumstances crumbling right before your eyes. You're stable. You're content because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who's strengthening you? Is it you or him? It's got to be God. I can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens me. So Paul said that when he was in the gutter, when he was in jail, he knew that it's possible he may lose his life. But in spite of all that, he was writing the church encouraging them from a jail cell and saying, look, if I, I know how to be content when I had a little, I knew how to be content when I had a lot. But in the end, it was God who, who is my strength. I can do all things. I can do anything through him. He's been there with me no matter what. I've gone through hell and back and God was there for me. So therefore I can do anything through Christ who strengthened me. Yes, I'm writing this in a jail cell, but hey, I'm okay. Guess what? While I'm here, I'm witnessing to the guards. I can do all things through Christ. There's a purpose for me being in here in jail. That's stability. That's joy, contentment, that regardless of what you're going through in life, you're okay. Why? Because God's there. He's got your back. And you know it for a fact. You're not just reading it chapter and verse. You've experienced for yourself, like I said last night, and I think the night before, when you know that God is real and you can trust him, you don't even need the Bible anymore to remind you of his faithfulness. I'm not in any way suggesting that you, you no longer read your Bible. But like I said last night, the Bible is recorded for us so that when we don't have experience with God, you don't know how faithful he is in your life, then you have to depend upon the Bible. Listen to me carefully. When you don't have any radical experience with God, if you've never experienced God to the fullest, you've never been pushed to the end of the cliff to see what he's capable of doing in your life, then you have to depend, and this is not bad, but listen to me, you have to depend on God and his word, chapter and verse. You have to say, you know, for example, that when Moses was hit with a trial, he had to face either the Egyptians on this side or the Red Sea over there and say, okay, I'm kind of in a dilemma now, a rock and a hard spot. If I go that way, I'm going to get caught. Pharaoh's going to take me in. We're going to be slaves again. But if I go this way, I'm going to see um, Shamu because there's a sea right in front of me. I can't. Depending on where I go, I'm stuck. Do I go that way and get caught or do I go that way and drown? So... When you read about how God parted the Red Sea and he was able to allow 7 million Israelites to pass through the sea on dry ground, not even muddy. God was so thoughtful 
Then he made sure that the the roads were not the ground was not even wet, so they would not be stepping in mud. And when they were carrying the elderly folks on their back and uh, on uh, slings, they would not get stuck. So as they trekked through the Red Sea on dry soil, the Egyptians came. And when they got to the other side, God closed the sea. And guess what? They drowned. They all drowned. And so now Moses has this phenomenal ex um, experience with the living God. Not only did he talk to him in the burning bush, but he saw what he's capable of doing. And so he walked through and you're supposed to read the Bible so that you will see what God is capable of doing so that when you go through hardship today, next year, and the following year, you have enough data based on the studying of God's word, then you can say, you know what? God, who was there for Moses, who was there for Paul, who was there for all the apostles and even the judges from the Old Testament, when you see what they were able to do with God's help, and see how even in a in a, a huge mess like with Joseph's life and how their, his family betrayed him, he was able to stand up and say, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. When you have that mindset and you see how faithful God is, then that should catapult you to where you can live for God and say, well, if that's true, then shoot, I don't really have anything to complain about. So let me serve you with my whole heart, my life, everything. I have no reason to not advance your cause. I mean, you saved me by the message of, of the gospel. You saved me by Jesus Christ, your son. So the least I can do is get the word out. So as you do these little things and you get hit left and right through life's challenges, you can say, well, I remember what Moses went through and God was faithful. And so now that motivates you to live out by faith, walk out by faith. And you can say, you know, if Joseph handled and went through all that and he came out clean and so did Moses and so did Daniel and Jeremiah, if Jehoshaphat, all of these uh, leaders from the Old Testament, if they were able to weather all that. So, Lord, I'm going to trust you myself. If that's true then I can trust you because now I'm a child of God. They were never a child of God. So if I'm a daughter or a son of God, then sh surely you'll take care of me too. And then you start stepping out in faith and then you see him work. So now you can say, okay, 2023, I had this near, this, this encounter. 2023, I almost lost this, that, and the other. So 2024, you, you charge 2024 full force and say, you know what? He delivered me from several things in 2023. So why would I doubt him? So now not only do you have all the stories of the Bible stored up in your soul, you have your own experience with God that no one has to know about, but just you and God, God and you. And then you can say, well, shoot, I can handle anything. I can do all things through Christ, just like Paul said in Philippians. So now I understand what that verse means. He doesn't mean I can fly like a bird. He just means that whatever goes on in life, I can go through it because God's in my corner. He's there. He can help me. So I have enough experience to keep me to keep my eyes focused on him and keep running the race because he's there for me. So that's the whole idea of learning the scripture so that you can move forward and not be discouraged. So that was joy. It's a, again, it's a, a relationship with God. It's a sense of stability and gladness, regardless of the circumstances. The next attribute is peace, which is uh, listed here. It, re it refers to a state of inner calm, closely related to joy. But this is peace itself, irene. It's a state of inner calm and tra tranquility that comes from being reconciled to God. It involves harmony with God, oneself and others, leading to a life free from constant anxiety or discord. So it's an inner peace. Again, a little nuanced, different from joy. Joy is a stability. Peace is more of a, almost like a feeling. Uh, so that's a direct result of being reconciled to God, which is, you know, sometimes you'll hear me say the peace of God and the peace with God. 
So the peace of God is going to be the direct result of the peace with God. So now that you have peace with God, you're no longer an enemy of him. You can experience his peace because of the relationship you have with him as a result of Jesus Christ. The next attribute is patience. Patience is right there in the uh, after P. Uh, it's pa it's long suffering here in the New King James. And so it's the idea to endure, persevere, and becoming it's it's not being easily frustrated or anger. That's the idea of having patience, a little bit more long suffering there. So it's characterized by forbearance and long suffering, patience right there, long suffering. And then next on the list is gentleness or kindness, showing goodness or kindness and benevolence towards other people, not just people you love, but people around you, people that you see. It involves treating others with compassion or empathy. And it's really the mirroring, the kindness of uh, the mercy of God, if you think about it. It's the characteristics of Christ. Again, these are the result of uh, properly aligned, being properly aligned with God, the Holy Spirit. Then you have this goodness. It's moral excellent or virtuous behavior. It involves doing what is right and just, which has the idea of abiding by God's standards. It's really characterized by integrity and righteousness. And then you have this gentleness on verse 23, also translated as meekness. It involves humility and a gentle spirit. It entails strength under control. And so it's avoiding harshness or harsh responses. And it's the idea of treating others with tenderness and respect. Every person is deserving of tenderness and respect because that person is made in the image of God. And so as you assault the person, you're assaulting someone who has been made in God's image. And so that's why these characteristics of God, the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is so important. It's so important that God, the Holy Spirit, is going to bestow that upon us as we're properly aligned with him so that we can treat those who are made in the image of God with tenderness and goodness and respect. And lastly, we have the idea of self-control. It refers to exercising discipline and restraint in one's thoughts, words, and actions. It involves governing one's desires and impulses and aligning them ultimately with God's will. So there you have it, the fruit of the Spirit. Wanted to comment on one last thing here. The last part against such there is no control. You see that there in the uh, tail end of uh, 23b against such there is no law. So my thoughts on that are the following. It's that basically Paul is saying that these qualities are not regulated or condemned by any legal or moral code because they align with God's character and his instructions for righteous living. So that you'll sometimes hear people say, what's that mean against there's no law? So it's not against the law? Yeah, it's not. Not against God's law. Because if you can, if these are a part of your life, there's nothing in God's word that would conflict with it. This is not in con conflict with God's law, any of it. The, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, love one another. None of those laws are in uh, opposition to 22 and 23. So they align with God's character and his instructions. So these virtues are expressions of a godly and transformed life led ultimately by God, the Holy Spirit. So these virtues are not in opposition to any divine law, okay? Any divine law. They exemplify the kind of life that fulfills God's intended purpose for believers. So that you that's Galatians 5, 22 to 23. So now let's go into our study. Again, we're looking at the spiritual life. And we're looking particularly, we started the section with Jesus Christ, our role model. So if you are... A Christian, if you are a believer trying to live the spiritual life, 
this is all about you and this is for you and for me. We are going to look at where we left off. Last week, we looked at the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Let's take off with this. The Father empowered the human nature of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is the God-man. He was God, 100% God, but also 100% man. So we're trying to emulate the human side of Jesus. Sometimes people say, I, I can't do what Jesus did because he's God. He is God, but he's 100% man as well. He took on the form of man when he came from heaven onto earth so that he can ultimately die on the cross for our sins. So you can't kill God. So this is the reason why he took on a second nature so that he can die. 100% God, 100% man. Uh, he was trichotomous, 100% body, soul, and spirit. So he was perfect. And now we're trying to study his life, his human side, so that we can mirror that in our own personal lives. This empowerment is the backbone of the spiritual life. Because he had no sin nature, he was empowered from birth. As God, Jesus Christ did not need any empowerment because he was God. He is omnipotent, John 10, 28. <clears throat> As man, he was powerless and thus relied on the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Let me just repeat what he said there because I think that's very, very important. As man, Jesus that is, he was powerless. He was limited and was reliant on the enabling power uh, power of God, the Holy Spirit. So if that's true, then we should follow suit because we're powerless too, right? I mean, isn't it true that we have weaknesses? We have our own personal struggles. We are powerless. So Jesus Christ himself was dependent on God, the Holy Spirit, as well as the word of God, which we'll see later on in the study. He's omnipotent as God, but as man, he was powerless. And so he was dependent upon the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. This explains why the fa Father empowered him. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For he, God, gives the Holy Spirit without measure. John 3, 34. Jesus confirms the Spirit of God is upon me. He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recover of sight to the blind, to set those who are downtrodden, Luke 4, 18. Bottom of page 36, the task of preaching the gospel, setting captives free from sin, giving sight to the blind and setting free those who are downcast requires sovereign power to overrule Satan, he, who is the ruler of this age, John 12, 31. He holds people captive to do his will, 2 Timothy 2, 26. It's the Holy Spirit provides the sovereign power, top of 37, to accomplish God's task. So again, let me repeat, it's God, the Holy Spirit, who provides the sovereign power necessary to accomplish God's task. So guess what? We need that sovereign power as well to accomplish God's task for us. Each of us have specific tasks that he's given to us in eternity past. And so as we find out what his perfect will is for our lives, as we get into his word, he empowers us to execute that, not in our own strength, not in our own volition, but in his power with divine viewpoint in mind. It explains the reason Jesus entered the ministry full of the Holy Spirit, Luke 4, 1. In the same way, if you are to fulfill God's plan for your life, you must depend on the Holy Spirit. The concept will be developed as our study advances, according to the author. Number six. Unbreakable fellowship, koinonia with God the Father. So you'll notice that we start off with 1 John 1 9. That's so that we can recover fellowship or koinonia with God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The moment you exercise 1 John 1 9, you recover the filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit you now have rapport with God. Because if you don't confess your sins, you have no fellowship with God. So the sixth characteristic observed is Jesus Christ's unbreakable fellowship with the other members of the Godhead. Fellowship is the key to living the spiritual life. Did you hear that? Fellowship is key, the key to living the spiritual life. Why is that? 
Because if you grieve the spirit, if you quench the spirit, you have no power, no horsepower. So you, you got to make sure that you're in fellowship. So that means starting off 1 John 1, 9. That means throughout the day, if you catch yourself of God, the Holy Spirit illuminates something that and brings something to your attention and says, look, stop doing that. Uh, confess your sins. That is wrong. You know that that's wrong. And you're you're sticking your nose up at me as if you can get away with it. No way. So if you if you ignore the nudging of God and you fail to confess your sins at that instant, you have no horsepower, no power to do what he wants you to do. And you will lack the peace. And not only that, he will discipline you whom the Lord loves. He disciplines. So don't play with that. Sometimes people say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it Saturday. No, do it now. Do it now. So John the Apostle stresses fellowship both in his gospel and in his epistles. His writings unveiled continued fellowship as the secret to the Lord's success in carrying out the Father's plan. So the, re the secret to Jesus' uh, success was on the ongoing fellowship that he maintained. So he goes on to say... Um, Jesus Christ's fellowship with the Father through the Holy Spirit was never, ever, ever interrupted. That is because of his impeccable nature, with which he had no sin nature and committed no sin, 1 Peter 2.22. This impeccability accorded his human nature constant access to the fruit of the Spirit, which is what we looked at, right? Love, joy, peace, and much more. We'll examine later in our study. Well, we, exa we examine it before our study. So amazingly, God has made the same power source available to us. Who's us? You and me. Us. That we can imitate his son. So that we can imitate his son. You want to imitate his son? You want peace? You want stability? You want power? It comes from imitating the son. So that power source comes from the ongoing fellowship with him and God the Holy Spirit. Amazingly, God has made the same power source available to us so that we can imitate his son, Jesus Christ, who lived triumphantly in the devil's world. I am the father and the father is in me. The father abiding in me does his works. John 14, 10. Note, you cannot be an authentic Christian, a copycat of Jesus Christ, unless you are spiritually vigilant. That is to say, Unless you are watchful of what goes in out of your soul, unless what goes in and out of your soul, Proverbs 4:23, you are serious in you are serious in resisting temptation, James 4, 7, and consistent in seeking restoration to fellowship when you do fail, 1 John 1, 9. We are in a spiritual war. We're in a battle. The sin nature is vividly alive in us. The source of inner temptation. There's a constant tug of war between Satan and the Holy Spirit to control the soul of a believer. This is supported with Galatians 5, 16 to 17. The good news is that you are the doorkeeper of your soul. You determine who wins the battle of occupancy. Top of 38. Your volition is crucial. What is volition? It's your decision, your free will to choose. Free will to exercise First John 1, 9 or your free will to turn your, your head to the side and say, oh, no, I don't want to do this. I, I'm tired of doing this. I sound like a robot. Do it. The more you grow in your faith, the more likely you are to stay in fellowship longer. I've often said the goal in the spiritual life is to keep advancing. You want to see a decrease in sin? Well, then keep advancing in your spiritual walk, your spiritual life. So although you can never fully eradicate sin or those struggles, those tendencies, you can see the temptations decrease in frequency and the, the sin itself is less pronounced over time. It's going to feel like it's less pronounced, but it's still there, but you're building spiritual muscle. And so as you mature spiritually, that takes care of the sin issue. It's not going to be as pronounced as you mature. And so, very, very important. Next is obedience, number seven. Obedience to God's word spells out right relationship with God. 
Jesus sought to obey the Father no matter what the cost. He was always making the sacrifices to do the Father's will. Obedience to God's word spells out right relationship with God and opens the gateway to receiving very important person, VIP, treatment from the throne of God or the throne of the Father, God. Jesus Christ was completely focused on obedience to the Father's will. He lived a lifestyle of obedience. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. He fused his will to the Father's will. It's one thing to say God first. How many times have you said that? God first. It's another thing to demonstrate it in action. We've got to put him first before all things. Jesus Christ determined to obey the Father even to the point of death. So that was a high priority for him. When he thought of the agony of the cross, he prayed, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thine will be done. Luke twenty two forty two. The Apostle Paul tells us, Jesus Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's, what's, that's what provided you and I salvation. That sacrifice that he did. By fulfilling the Father's plan. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of cross, even death on the cross. The apostle underscored what type of death Jesus died. The most demeaning, humiliating, and painful death of all. To this end, he claimed, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 10. He also exhibited obedience, which is what we should follow as well. Bottom of 38, Jesus developed a lifestyle of humility. Never arrogant, never prideful. Humility is a mental attitude where one aligns his thoughts with God's. And the only way you can do that is by getting into the word of God on a consistent basis, not hitting it once in a while, but regularly. I mean, this is why we have multiple studies in our ministry. We have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sundays. And so when you... Take those into consideration. We have ample ammo, that's ammo, for your arsenal to fight and over, to overtake the adversary. So God, humility is a mental attitude whereby one aligns his thoughts with God's, realizing that whatever the individual has become is a matter of who and what God is, no more, no less, top of 39. Jesus unequivocally states, he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Luke 18, 14. How true. He is the epitome of humility. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Jesus Christ, although God in the flesh, never elevated himself. He showed us that the true, meaning of the true meaning of humility is serving others. In John's gospel, we clearly see humility demonstrated. Jesus Christ poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he, which, with which he was girded. John 13, 5. Ah, the, hold it right there. Washing the feet is an ancient practice. It's an unpleasant task reserved for the lowliest slave in the household. The slave would take seat at the doorway and wait for those entering the house. To truly understand this passage, we must interpret the Bible considering the time in which it was written. The condition of the road was dusty or muddy, mixed with animal refuse. In other words, doo-doo. Right. Imagine the feet of one who walked miles and arrived at your doorstep. They would be filthy. In fact, by today's standards, we would consider the disciples' feet too filthy even for a slave to wash, much, much less their master. This explained the Apostle Peter's reaction. Lord, do you wash my feet? John 13, 6. Today we might say, Lord, don't even think about it. Peter realized the task for, was for a slave, not for a slave's master. The Lord had made his point. Let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. 
So we ought to have that attitude. When you see someone, you want to serve them. Don't wait to be served. Extend grace, be Christ-like, serve them. How can I help? How can I do this? And take initiative because that's the example that Christ left us. Number nine, mental attitude of grace. Jesus was grace-oriented. Grace is an expression of mental attitude free of ulterior motives. Treating one not on the basis of their worth or status, but on the basis of God's perfect agape love. So you treat them because of the love that flows from you. Bestowing compassion and mercy on us, the unlovely ones, an unmerited favor kind of love. Jesus Christ pioneered grace and the gospel says, top of 40, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John 1.17. It is one thing to talk about grace. It is another thing to demonstrate it. Reading through the gospel, one makes an interesting observation. The Lord never mentioned the word grace in his teachings, but he demonstrated it. He didn't have to define it. He just lived it out. It's one thing to say, I'm gracious. I'm grace oriented. Oh, I'm free grace. But it's quite another to exhibit that with your lifestyle, how you treat others. How do you treat others? Is it grace-oriented or are you just saying, yeah, I'm gracious. Look at me. Look at the way I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm kind, right? It, it's quite a different thing when you look at the life of Christ because like the author says here, he, he lived it out. He didn't have to define it. Here's what grace means. He didn't have to say that. He lived it out and the people understood that. Especially thinking about how many of them during the ancient world couldn't even read. So he was just teaching by example, by lifestyle. They say more is caught than taught. What does that mean? You learn from what you see than what, you're, what you say. Uh, what you see rather than what you say. More is caught than taught. He goes on to say, on the other hand, experience has shown us that people in Christianity today who talk so much about grace often lack action. Totally agree. The Apostle John captured Christ's demonstration of grace in at least two instances, the woman caught in adultery and the Apostle Peter's denial of Christ. So the woman caught in adultery is the first one here. God abhors adultery both in the Old and New Testament teachings. In the Old Testament, capital punishment was God's mandate for one guilty of adultery. No grace, no exception. If a man is caught having sexual relationships with a sexual relations with a married woman, then both of them die. Both of them must die. The man who had sex with the woman and the woman herself so that the evil will be removed from Israel. Deuteronomy 22, 22. The religious Jew uh, brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus to see how the Lord would handle this case. In John 8, 4 to 6, he amazed them. Challenged, challenging them, he said, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. The response was quite astonishing. Everyone but the woman left the scene without throwing a stone. Turning to the woman, the Lord asked, did no one condemn you? Verse 10, no one, Lord, was her grateful reply. Verse 11, what she heard from the Lord was contrary to her expectation. I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Verse 11, this was grace in action. He let her go. But Here's something really interesting that we, I think we failed to note. You know how he spared her? He used the word of God. It was the word of God that saved her soul, saved her life. Because Jesus quoted the scripture and said, whoever has not sinned, you cast the first stone. And the Bible actually saved her life from being uh, killed. She didn't die, right? She wasn't stoned to death there. So if you think it through, the Bible can really save you, literally. Now, Peter's denial of Christ, and I think this is as far as we can get. We have five minutes. Bottom of 40. The apostle Peter had earlier testified regarding the deity of Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. He knew Jesus was God in the flesh. Later, Jesus was arrested and scourged by the Romans. Seeing Jesus badly brutalized beyond recognition as per Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 52, 14, top of 41, the apostle Peter changed his testimony when confronted. 
he began to curse and swear. I don't know the man, Matthew 27, 20, 73. Swearing was considered a double authentication of one's truthfulness in their culture. That's how far the apostle went in his denial of his Messiah. He also denied him two other times before the cock crowed, just as Jesus had prophesied. Peter abandoned hope altogether, thinking all was lost. Peter had denied the Lord, but the Lord did not respond in kind. The apostle Paul vividly captures the truth of the Lord's uh, the Lord's faithfulness. If we are faithful as Peter was, he remains faithful to his promise, for he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 Observe, when Jesus Christ found the apostle Peter, he did not rebuke or judge him for denying and abandoning him at his trial. Rather, what he did was breathtaking. He invited the apostle Peter and his colleagues come and have breakfast John 21, 12, that's grace. He had a long grace season discussion with the Apostle Peter, which led to the Apostles' Fellowship Restoration 15 to 17. He then gave him a leadership role. Shepherd my sheep, verse 16. Are we missing something? What a trade-off. That's what grace is about. Treating one based on the character of the one giving, not on the basis of the recipient's worth or status. But this is where we'll conclude tonight on page 41. We will look at sharing God's word and the next time we come on next week. But for now, I'm going to open it up for any questions that you might have. So just unmute your mic. And let me see. Let's see what we have here. And by the way, I didn't get to introduce Susan formally. For those who did not meet her last night or the night before, uh, this is Susan on the screen. Hi, Susan. Wave your hand like that. Can you hear me, Susan? Or oh, Stacy? I'm sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, I was, uh, yeah, this I was is like, Stacy. My name. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, I kept saying Susan, but I, I said it wrong. I apologize, Stacy. No worry. Yeah. So, uh, any thoughts or comments, anybody? Either Galatians five or anything here with the study. What do you guys think? How do you fare thus far with uh, what we're learning and what is the spiritual life? I I kind of have. Like, I kind of, I'm glad that I saw that you guys were having this today because I, I did miss yesterday, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, I had a really, really tough day. You did? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but um, I'm trying to figure out how to, it was with what you were saying at the very beginning with, you know, the love and the and the uh, patience and mm. all of that and um, mm. kind of like what you were learning like you were learning to do mm -hmm. um kind of like into my situation i'm i'm uh, i'm grieving oh you oh. are i'm sorry um <laughs> um it's of my service dog oh mm -hmm. I so it's tomorrow will be a month and it feels like yesterday and I was out of control as far as I could not control my crying today mm -hmm. and I decided to lay down and I asked I begged for you know help yeah uh, I actually said I surrender to you mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden I felt this calmness in me and mm. I'm trying to figure out in my head how there are some things that you said that I can't quite remember that kind of goes along with what I mm. felt earlier mm -hmm. well that's a good thing <laughs> that's yes. why I think our paths have crossed uh Stacy 
so that you can be around more of his word, because I think that's the key to life is to learn his word, to learn the doctrines that are full of his word collectively as you study it, like what we're what we learned tonight, the spiritual life. See, whatever we go through, uh, there's always a reason. So apparently you lost your service dog, and that's painful because for for many of us, uh, when we have um, a dog, it, it's very, it's like family, right? So if you've had your dog for so long, then you you love that dog, and especially if it's a service dog. So it's not easy to just say, oh, it's just, I'll get another one. It's not that easy. So what that tells me, Stacy, is that you love your dog. What was the, what was your dog's name? Chloe. So you love Chloe. There's nothing wrong with expressing um, a sense of loss and because you love Chloe. And so you recognize that, okay, I'm grieving still. It's been a month. I, I obviously still long for Chloe. And that's very normal because that just tells me and the rest of us that Chloe was close to you. You were close to Chloe. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And you, you shouldn't beat yourself up over that and say, well, why am I still going through this? That just means you had a great love for Chloe. And so that's very special. And so look at it for what it is. You love Chloe and that doesn't change anything. So that's very, it says a lot about Chloe. And I wish I could have met Chloe myself. But it just means that you had a, a strong love for Chloe. And it sounds like Chloe was a great dog. So in the meantime, you can grow in your relationship with God, who will then, um, like the Gal Galatians 5 passage, he will allow you to sense a peace. He will allow you to sense a self-control that includes your emotions and a sense of stability, which is the joy that comes from the fruit of the Spirit. You don't want to deny all of that and say, well, it's not really happening. Of course it is. Otherwise, you wouldn't love Chloe, right? So embrace it for what it is and say, okay, Lord, you know what? At least I was able to have such a fantastic relationship with Chloe. That shows me that you love me. So if that's the case, what more with your son? I mean, you gave me your own son. And so not only did I have Chloe, but I have Jesus Christ. Not only do I have Chloe, but I have Jesus Christ as my savior and friend. And so you really do love me. So as I reflect on one month ago, what more when we come to Christmas time, apparently that marks 2000 years. So if I'm, I'm still grieving over 30 days ago, 2000 years ago, you demonstrated your love for me through giving me your son and Lord, I love you. So you've allowed me to meet a fellowship of believers who seem like they're really kind and loving. And so you're, it, it shows me that you love me. Maybe these people around in Elisa Viejo are going to be my friend and are going to help me advance in my walk as I get to know you more through your word. And so I'm grateful for my new friends. And so it, it's certainly helping me see you in a different way. And so as I get to know you more, Lord, I want more of that love. I want more of that stability and that peace that regardless of the circumstances, I know you're in my corner. It's another relationship that is extremely important. And I'm learning more about it more and more every time I meet with Pastor Freddie and the brethren on online. So, you know, I, we're learning more about you too, Stacy. So we all have our own pains and hiccups along the way. And so, but we can understand that. And we're, we're glad that you can open up and share this because now we know what to pray for. We know how to pray for you. And should you need to talk to any of us, I don't think of anybody here that would not want to talk to you. Everybody here is a very friendly, safe, they don't bark, they don't bite anymore. <laughs> they certainly are friendly people. I can certainly attest to that. So you can ask anybody here, if you ever need a friend to talk to, just, you know, I would even encourage you to, on the chat box, just put your email address or whatever you want so any of us can contact you. 
And uh, yeah, well, a lot of them are local in the local area, Mission Viejo, Irvine, San Francisco, Stockton, up there. So, but we all would love to get to know you more, Stacy. So there's a reason why God has kind of put us together like this. But I appreciate you being honest and uh, fragile and sharing your painful experience because I'll definitely keep that in prayer. That's not something to just turn your back on. It certainly Thank says you. certainly says a lot about you as a caring person and Chloe as a, a very friendly service dog. So a lot of us here are uh, pet lovers too. We've, we've, some of us have lost pets, pets in the past, so we know that's not easy to, to ignore or just say, oh, well, it's just a dog. No, that's not, it's not like that at all. It's family. Anybody else have anything to say? Thank you. Or, okay. Uh, or you might, anybody here want to say something to Stacy? Just unmute your mic and let her know what you think, your thoughts, maybe a, a word of encouragement if you have anything to say. Hi, Stacy. This is Karen. Um, Hi. I want you to know that I was uh, just looking at our refrigerator and we have pictures of our two dogs that we lost several years ago. Um, so, you know, they're still special to us even several years later. Um, but, you know, what Pastor Freddie says is true. The more we study God's word, the more um, that strength and stability and peace that he talks about comes through. But there's always, there's going to be a grieving process at this point. And just know we'll be praying for you. And if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. Thank um, you, Karen. And I, I got your email, so I'll, oh, good. I'll, I'll contact you, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Very welcome. good. Thank you, Karen. All right. Anybody else have anything to say? Questions, comments? If not, I will close in prayer. All right. And don't forget last week, uh, next week is our last week together. So concluding with Thursday, and then we'll meet in January, January 9th. But we will have class next week. And we will have a, a live stream on Saturday for our Christmas party. And uh, Stacy, if you, since you're in the local area, maybe you can join them too. I'm sure you'll have a blast, okay? And we'd love to see you. And uh, we also stream our Sunday services. Rudy, are you going to come down, to, uh, Elisa Viejo? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm supposed to come, go to, on the 20th, I'm going there. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. But well, good for you. Not, not this week. Not this week. Okay. Next time. Next time. Okay. I, I'm just, I know I'm picking on you a lot, Rudy. That's because you're fun to pick on, so... So, Rudy, you were going to be down here for the 24th? No, uh, 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 see, my 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 wife's granddaughter is coming, so we have to bring her to Disneyland. Oh, Those wow. Days, yeah, uh, but they have to fly back on the, 20, on the 21st. Mm. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, we just go in and go out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I wish I could stay longer, but uh, my wife is still working. <laughs> well, we understand, Rudy. So actually, Rudy, why don't I, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to close in prayer. Is that okay? Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the things that you have done to us. And thank you for giving us our eternal life that we, we, we you, that you, you gave us that is not going to be taken out. And thank you for the study that we have today. And, and you know, with Stacy, we pray to give him comfort, Lord. And we know you are the one who uh, do all those things. And we thank you, Lord, for the study that we have today and understanding that how you are and how our life should be. It's like in your image. And we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for all the great things that you have done. And thank you for Pastor Buddy who give us the word, your word, and explain to us what you want us to do. And please, Lord, guide us in our daily life. Now we're going to be being separated. Be with us, Lord. And we always uh, 
uh, confidence on you that you're not going to let us go. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Amen. I'll see you all next week or Saturday or Sunday, whichever you can attend. Hopefully all of Amen. them. Amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Winston. Bye, Winston. Thank you, Rudy. Bye, Bye Rudy. Bye. 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 Bye.